And a bit of works. of colleges and how do you feel about the current educational system here? I think universities are making seven fatal errors. Apparently it seems to be fine if a woman wants to play a patriarchal role that seems to be perfectly fine. It's corrupt but it's okay if women occupy the positions of power. It's like okay. What do you not know a lot about that if asked about you don't really have that strong of an opinion or research on those topics? You have a moral duty to supersede the accomplishments of the person who bore that name and gave it its weight before you dare capitalize on it in the public sphere. And there's truly did none of that. Right? We're never gonna see Prime Minister Jordan Peterson. That's not that's not in the equation. Um So look, we get a lot of guests on Body Tamer, but one of the most highly requested guests ever by you on Value Tamer has been Dr. Jordan Peterson, clinical psychologist professor at the University of Toronto, as well as the author of 12 Rules for Life. Dr. Jordan Peterson, thanks for joining us here with Value Tamer. Thanks so, for the invitation. Yes, definitely. It's good to have you. You know, this, if you if you don't know Dr. Jordan Peterson, if you, you know, I, I would say total views, because I've seen some of your views, 50 million on Facebook, 80 million, some stuff has gone completely viral. I'd say total of billion views, give or take, maybe even more than that with your content that's on YouTube, Facebook all over the place. People now know the name Dr. Jordan Peterson, and the part I want to spend some time uh, talking to you about today is a couple things. One, obviously a lot of people who interview you, they're going to talk to you about politics, religion, God, postmodernism, all of these things, and maybe we'll get into some of that stuff, but what I'm very curious about with you is the following. One is who Jordan Peterson was growing up, right? I mean, you read the stories about at 13 years old, you were given a book and you started studying some of I think Ayn Rand, George Orwell, and some of these books that were given to you, and then from there you have other inspirations that came up, and I think at one point at Harvard you were studying drugs and alcohol and the addiction reasoning, why do we get addicted, and then you become who you become, and you have some strong opinions. But I want to know who you were in high school. If I was in high school today with you, we're in 10th grade, we're classmates, I'm sitting next to you, we're good friends, who's Jordan Peterson? Uh, well, first, I'm not very tall. So I was younger than most of the people in my class because I skipped grade one. Okay. Um, so I, I was five foot two in grade ten. Really? So yeah, yeah, yeah. And so uh, I suppose that made me a little bit more agile verbally than I might have otherwise been. Most of my friends were working class guys. Most of them quit school in junior high and, and early in high school. Most of the friends that I had in high school were very comical people. I had four very close friends from a little tiny town even north of where I grew up and there was almost nothing north of where I grew up. Uh, they were extremely comical people and so we told jokes to each other all the time, tried to amuse each other. I spent a lot of time driving around on the country listening to music, drinking beer with my friends out in the bush. In yeah. high school. Yeah. Right. So well, beer, beer yeah. helps to think the way you think about it, I guess. That's well, the recipe. So long winters in northern Alberta. You know, and not, not a tremendous amount to do. And, well, it's it, not atypical teenage behavior. That was me in high school. I read all the time. I oh, you did? So one. you yeah. were reading all the time? Yeah, yeah, I read a book a day for years. Are you kidding me? No, most of it was science fiction. I had a neighbor across the street who had a huge science fiction collection, a whole wall, and he used to let me come in there once a week or so, and I'd pick like seven or eight books, and I'd take them home and read them, and then I'd come back and get another eight. I read science fiction and like that. So I don't know. From what age? Oh, ten, probably. One a day? Yeah, yeah, that was my that was wow. my goal. 
Now, are you a speed reader? Do you go through a I'm very fast reader. Were you always fast back then as well? Yeah, I, I learned to read when I was very young. My father taught me to read when I was very young, and uh, I'm very fast. Did he teach you how to fast read, or were you just, you just started reading, so that was something that was very... Yeah, easy well, to I, I wouldn't say specifically he taught me to speed read. Um, he just taught me to read, and I guess I'm happy to be relatively fast at it. So it, it, uh, that's been a very useful thing for me. So your dad had a big influence on you. Yeah, you had a big yeah, yeah. He spent a lot of, you bet. He spent a lot of time with me when I was a little kid. You know, we used to, he used, he used to come home every night. We'd spend an hour or so reading. He had designed this. He was a teacher. He had a workbook, which I still have, that, that outlined all the phonics, the, the um, all the sounds of all the letters, the sounds of all the two-letter combinations, all of that. And we went over that every night, and and I, that happened for a long time. From the time I was probably three onward, I think. At three years old? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, what did your mom do? My mom, well, when, when I was a kid, she took care of us. She stayed home. Yeah. She was trained as a nurse. She never practiced as a nurse, though. So, uh, she had kids. And then later, she became librarian for a local college. And she had a career that lasted about 20 years as head librarian. And she was a very, is, both my parents are still alive. She's a very pleasant person, very funny. She has a great sense of humor. I used to make her laugh all the time, so that's, and I still do, sometimes on purpose, sometimes I <laughs> yeah. And so humor, was the humor, has the humor always been part of your MO? Like, have you always been somebody that wrote oh, yeah. jokes? Yeah, definitely. Well, it was a big part of the culture in Northern Alberta. Like, it was a big deal if you were funny. I've talked to a lot of Canadians, and mm -hmm. we drank a lot of coconut, and I knew you guys are funny people. Yeah. I mean, they know how to have fun. Yeah, well, there's a lot of Canadian comedians, eh? Yeah, yeah, that's right. We export them yeah. down the state so that you guys have something to We, we need your help because we need some good comedians down here, right? So, but you the, better be funny if you're going to live through a Canadian winter. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. you, definitely you, better amuse, you better be amusing. Yeah. So, yeah, it was an important thing. Like a lot of what we did with, when we were kids, when we were adolescents in particular, was just try to sit around and amuse each other. With your dad, we need sarcastic comments. I grew up in that. I was in the military, so this is very normal for us. We right. like witty, we like sarcasm. Some people have a hard time with that, but it's. Yeah. <coughs> uh, uh, I think it's more of a working class thing, you know. I think so as well. That's yeah, and I point. really miss it. I really like it because as I sort of moved up the ranks, yeah. let's say um, on the academic front, that became less and less common. You get your wit from that side, or do you think that's part of the DNA? You were born being witty or because you were in an environment that you had to be witty that made you survive so the person Oh yeah, that was definitely part of it. Well, it was also because I was, was small and and mouthy, it was very useful to be sarcastic and witty too because it was the only defense that I had so, really. That's so, point. you know, people would come after me. I mean, everybody gets, there's lots of physical yeah. back and forth in junior high and high school, but um, people would come after me and I could defend myself reasonably well with my tongue, so... I think Ben Shapiro has a similar story as well. Yeah. He's a similar guy. Too. Yeah. Because he was a year ahead, I think it's a year, you know, and he, had, he was always smaller, so he had yeah. to figure out a way to stand up and he was being bullied. I don't think you don't mess with Shapiro, though, right? man. No, no, his brain is no, awesome. Man. Yeah, yeah, he's the fast. Way he is, it's, yeah. it's, it's quite impressive. I've yes, watched him is. lots of times on YouTube. Yeah. You, you want to mess with him at your peril. Yeah, we've had him on my attendee before, and the way he thinks is also very interesting how we... Uh, processes issues. So let me ask you, when you said your dad was teaching you how to read from three years old and he's going through it and then all of a sudden you pick up and you start reading the book a day, would you also have dialogue with your dad? Hey dad, what do you think about this? Hey. No, I wouldn't say not okay, so much. That's no, dad's quite introverted. And, really? Uh, yeah. So there yeah. wasn't a debate type of a format no, with your, so no. your family wasn't, I can't believe Prime Minister No, no, this. no, very little. Very little. Dad figured he wouldn't be happy if he would be born a hundred years earlier. I mean, he grew up in a log cabin, grew up, literally, and he grew up on this, this well, my, my grandparents were the original homesteaders in Saskatchewan. Canada, Western mm -hmm. Canada, is about 100 years behind the Western It's a beautiful US. area, by the way. That whole area, they've got some nice property. Yes, yes, and, and so, and his parents were from, his parents were of Norwegian extraction, and they built a log cabin in the middle of the damn prairie, and that's where he grew up, and, you know, he's a hunter and a trapper and a fisherman, and he likes to be outside. He likes to spend time alone, although he's got close friends, but these are people that he mostly does these, you know, just hunting and fishing. And that's, I mean, he was a teacher. He was the fire chief in our local town. He ran a huge or huge fishing game association, imported elk to northern Alberta. There were no elk up there before, before the organization brought them up there. And so, but that was his life. And he's a gunsmith and a gun collector, and he has like, I don't know how many guns. And, and, and so that's his culture and his life. And, and it wasn't ever something that I was really part of. I mean, I went hunting with him. 
I went fishing and trapping with him. We used to camp all the time when I was a kid. We weren't a particularly political family or a, a philosophically oriented family for that matter. I mean, my dad's very smart. And philosophically oriented yeah, family? No, or not? Her, no, was it a religious so. family? Was it a church no, family? Not really, was it let's not read the really. Bible every day? Let's pray? Oh, no, definitely not. Really? Definitely not. So, I where mean, did the debate come from? What, what is your ability to be able to listen, process, respond? Where did that ability come from? Was it when you went into academia? Is it, is it post? Yeah, it probably. I, I think to some degree it's, it's, it's a natural ability. I mean, even when I was a graduate student, when I was first teaching, I, I seemed to be good at it, my, the classes that I taught as a graduate student. And that was without any previous teaching experience were popular. And then, I, well, now I've been teaching, I've been lecturing for you know, multiple times a week for 30 years. And so, and I also very seldom relied on notes. I mean, I, to begin with, when you don't know a topic very well, you have to scaffold the conversation with notes. You know, but I, I always very loosely stuck to my notes. I would prepare a lot beforehand, but then... To I know a power, if I come, you're not going to give a PowerPoint speech. Here's what we're doing. Right. You're just going to speak. And right. When I, you know, when PowerPoint first came out, I used it more... Uh, I relied on it more than I did once I got accustomed to it. But no, it's better to... It's better to sketch out your, your talk and then rely on your notes as little as possible if you can manage it. I learned to do that and I like I practiced doing that so that I could get to the point where I could speak extemporaneously. How do you practice that? You just try to stay farther and farther away from your notes as you as you oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. So well, you, I'm saying do you role play, do you sit there with the notes nope. first and then you set it no, aside? No, 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 no. Okay. Usually what I do, that that's a good question. I mean, first of all, I, I try to be over prepared in some sense. So I mean I believe that if you're going to if you're gonna give a twenty minute lecture, you should have an hour of material at hand. Because that way you have an opportunity to sort of move spontaneously through the material. But generally, what I do now, because I have a lot of material at hand, a lot of stories and a lot of things that I knowledge say that I've accrued over the years, usually before a lecture, I'll say, this is the hard part. And I can do a lecture without doing this, but it's better if I do this. This is the hard part. I'll sit down for 20 minutes with my eyes closed, and I figure out what the what the central topic 